Book Four, Chapter Four, Part One of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Four, Organization, Chapter Four, Part One, Limpieza. Repeated allusions have occurred above to the limpieza, or purity of blood, required in all officials of the Inquisition. This was so remarkable a development of the prevailing fanaticism, and exercised so much influence on the social condition of Spain, that it deserves a somewhat detailed investigation. The first indication of this exclusiveness is seen in the Setencia Estatuto of Toledo, in 1449, under which all conversos were stripped of their official positions as being suspect in the faith, volume 1, page 126. This, as we have seen, elicited the bull of Nicholas V, denouncing such legislation as unchristian, forbidding discrimination between old and new Christians, and confirming the laws to that effect of Alfonso X, Henry III, and Juan II. This was evaded in the founding of a confraternity, under the title of Christian Love, in Cordova, in 1473, from which all conversos were rigorously excluded, leading to the tumults and massacres described above. It may have been this which induced Archbishop Carrillo of Toledo, in a provincial synod held at Alcala, to denounce the growing practice of brotherhoods bound under oaths to exclude conversos and alleging these oaths in justification. All such statutes were declared invalid, and all who had taken such oaths were released from them. In 1473 also, Juan II of Aragon abrogated the statutes of a similar organization in Majorca, and ordered that conversos should have full enjoyment of all faculties in his dominions. A somewhat ludicrous aspect was given to this prejudice by a guild of stonemasons in Toledo, composed principally of Mudejares, which, in 1481, adopted a rule forbidding members from teaching their art to conversos, and the next year a still more prescriptive statute was adopted in Guipuscoa, prohibiting conversos from settling or marrying in the province. The earliest official recognition of a distinction between old and new Christians was the bull of Sixtus IV in 1483, ordering that Episcopal inquisitors should be old Christians. The next step was more portentous of the future. When, in 1485, the temporary inquisition was established in the Geronimite monastery of Guadalupe, a Jew was found among the monks who had been living as one of them for forty years, and yet had never been baptized. His prompt burning in front of the convent gates did not allay the dread that other heretics might find similar refuge in the order, leading the general chapter to decree that no descendant of a Jew should be admitted. Those already entered, if they had not professed, were expelled, and those who had professed were incapacitated for any honor or dignity. Much discussion ensued. The decree was held as contravening the bull of Nicholas V in 1449, and there was prospect of trouble, leading Ferdinand and Isabella to apply to Innocent VIII for a remedy. He evaded a decision in the brief Deset Romanum, September 25, 1486, by clothing the Archbishop of Seville and all bishops of Cordova and Leon with authority to decide all questions under the decree, and to revoke, modify, and strengthen it at their discretion. This, of course, was held to be a practical confirmation of the new rule, and we are told that Our Lady of Guadalupe was so delighted that she coruscated in miracles, which Fray Francisco Sancho de la Fuente undertook to record, but they were so abundant that his zeal was exhausted, and he abandoned the pious task. The next instance was a special and limited one, after Torquemada had founded at Avila his convent of St. Thomas Aquinas, he grew apprehensive that the hatred which he had earned from the conversos might lead them to enter it with evil intent. In 1496 he therefore applied to Alexander the Sixth for a decree forbidding the reception of any one descended, directly or indirectly, from Jews, 
a request which the pontiff readily granted, subjecting to ipso facto excommunication any prior or other person contravening the rule. The tendency to discriminate against conversos was stimulated by the disabilities inflicted under the canon law on the children and grandchildren of impenitent heretics. This will be treated more fully hereafter, and it suffices to say here that it was construed as applying to the children and grandchildren of all condemned or reconciled by the Inquisition. It was the subject of some debate, and the instructions of 1488 required inquisitors to enforce by heavy penalties the incapacity of such descendants to hold any public office, or be admitted to holy orders. These disabilities were extended still further by the sovereigns, in two pragmaticas of 1501, forbidding the children and grandchildren by the male line, and the children by the female, to hold any office of honour, or to be notaries, scriveners, physicians, surgeons, or apothecaries. These pragmaticas were promptly sent by the Suprema to all tribunals, with orders for their strict enforcement, as the sovereigns did not permit exceptions to be made. In this rising tide of proscription, it is pleasant to find an exception. There was no more uncompromising defender of the faith than Jimenez, but, in organizing his University of Alcala, he made no discrimination against conversos. In his carefully elaborated details as to qualifications for professorships, fellowships, degrees, and the other objects of academic ambition, there is not a word indicating that the taint of Jewish or Moorish blood was an obstacle. It was doubtless this which accepted Alcala from the ominous decree of the Suprema, November 20, 1522, prohibiting Salamanca, Valladolid, and Toledo from conferring degrees upon any convert from Judaism, or on any son or grandsons of one condemned by the Inquisition where it found warrant for such assumption of authority it might be difficult to say but the effect of such proscription can scarce be exaggerated in thus barring the way to all the learned professions and consequently to public employment and ecclesiastical preferment the next step was taken by the observantine franciscans who in fifteen twenty five procured from Clement the Seventh a brief providing that in Spain no fraile descended from Jews, or from one convicted by the Inquisition, should be promoted to any office or dignity, and that thereafter no one laboring under such defect should be admitted into that order. By this time the question of limpieza was ever present, and every one was popularly classed as an old Christian or a new, for genealogies seem to have been public property. When, in 1528, Diego de Uceda was tried for Lutheranism, and claimed to be an old Christian, the Toledo Tribunal sought testimony in Cordova, where the witnesses unhesitatingly described his family, paternal and maternal, as perfectly pure from stain of converso blood, which they said was notorious throughout the city. The increasing importance of the matter led the Inquisition to amass evidence for itself, and, in 1530, the tribunals were ordered to summon before them the descendants of all who had been relaxed or reconciled, and ascertain whether they had changed their names. From this general inquest, each tribunal compiled for its own district a number of genealogies, comprising all the infected families, which, when duly kept up, preserved a mass of testimony infinitely disquieting to subsequent generations. The growing importance of the questions involved, to society at large, is indicated by a petition of the Cortes of Segovia in 1532, that those should be held as old Christians who could prove their descent from Christian parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, or, if necessary, from great-great-grandparents, and that no imputation of lack of limpieza should be cast on them, unless there is evidence to prove their descent from Jews or Moors, or that an ancestor had been condemned by the Inquisition. The Dominicans were not as active as the Franciscans in obtaining papal protection of their limpieza. In a long list of briefs conceded to Spanish Dominican houses, there is no allusion to the exclusion of conversos 
between Torquemadas of 1496 and 1531, when the houses of Santa Maria Nieba and San Pedro Martir of Toledo were forbidden to receive any fraile suspected of Jewish or Moorish origin, while in the College of Santa Maria the professors and students of arts and theology were required to be free from all suspicion of such descent. The sentiment of the order was less proscriptive than that of the Franciscans. Its most conspicuous member of the period was Thomas de Vio, better known as Cardinal Caetano, who, when consulted in 1514 by the regent of Salamanca, as to the legality of excluding those of Jewish blood from the order, replied that it was not a mortal sin, but, seeing that the race had furnished Jesus Christ and the apostles and the salvation of man, it was irrational and ungrateful to discriminate against them, as well as an obstacle to their conversion. Paul III agreed with him, for, in a motu proprio of 1535, addressed to the Dominican provincial, he forbade any impediment to the entrance in the order of those of Jewish or Moorish blood, and, on learning that this was disregarded in some houses, he repeated and confirmed it with censures by a brief of August 3, 1537. In this, as in so much else, any one seemed able to get from the Holy See whatever he wanted, and Paul reversed himself in 1538, when the convent of San Pablo of Cordova represented that, in most of the colleges of the order, descendants of conversos were not received, or, if admitted in error, were ejected, and it desired the same concession to its college, as necessary for its preservation and the peace of the house. Paul promptly acceded to this request, and ordered that the inquisitors and the dean of Cordova to defend the convent in these privileges, even to calling in the aid of the secular arm. This was followed by a more general measure in 1542, when, by command of Paul, Cardinal Juan de Toledo, Bishop of Burgos, prohibited the Dominicans of Aragon from receiving into the order descendants of Jews or of convicts of the Inquisition to the fourth generation. It is not likely that this was confined to Aragon, and in the next year we find the Suprema addressing the provincial and the definitors, urging that no conversos be allowed to enter. Charles V was as inconsistent as Paul III. In 1537 he issued a decree reciting that as, in some colleges of the universities, admittance was refused to new Christians, he ordered that the constitutions of the founders be observed. Yet when the chapter of Cordova, in 1530, adopted a statute of limpieza applicable to all the ministrants of the cathedral, and was unable to obtain papal confirmation, he ordered its observance, and contributed by his influence to induce Paul IV, in 1555, to confirm it. The movement was one which was constantly gaining momentum. In 1548, Archbishop Silicio of Toledo enumerates, among the bodies refusing admission to all except old Christians, the three great military orders of Santiago, Calatrava, and Alcantara, membership in which was the object of ambition to almost every Spanish layman of gentle birth. In all the Spanish colleges, including that of Bologna, founded by Cardinal Albornoz, none but old Christians were received, and from these colleges were drawn the members of councils and chancelleries and other judicial officials. It was the same with the Minims, by express statute of the founder of St. Francis de Paula, and in other orders and monasteries of both men and women. Cathedral chapters were beginning to adopt it, such as those of Cordova and Jaén. Numerous confraternities were based upon it, and many mayorascos, or entailed estates, were conditioned on it. Thus the mania for absolute purity of blood was spreading irresistibly, and, while it would be impossible now to enumerate accurately the bodies which made it a condition precedent of membership, it is safe to say that the avenues of distinction, and even of livelihood, in public life and in the church, were rapidly closing to all who bore the fatal mancha or stain. In time, even admission to holy orders required proof of limpieza. The conversos, however, were too able and energetic to yield without a struggle, 
and how the losing battle was waged is seen in the decisive case of the primatial church of Toledo. The Cardinal Archbishop Tavera attempted, in 1539, to procure the adoption of a statute of Limpieza in the cathedral, but the opposition was so strong that he was obliged to desist. His successor was Juan Martinez Pedernales, who adopted the classic appellation of Siliceo, a Salamanca professor who had the luck to be appointed tutor to Prince Philip and was rewarded with the See of Murcia in 1541, whence he was translated to Toledo in 1546. He was roused to indignation when, in September of that year, papal letters were presented to the chapter granting a canonry to Dr. Hernán Jiménez, whose father had been reconciled by the Inquisition. Although the chapter had several converso members, it refused admission to Jiménez, and wrote a rambling and inconsequential letter to Paul III, justifying its disobedience. To prevent such contamination for the future, Siliceo drew up a statute forbidding that any but an old Christian should hold a position in the cathedral, even down to the choir boys. All aspirants were to present their genealogies and deposit a sum of money to defray the expense of an investigation. In July 1547 he came to Toledo with a large retinue of gentlemen, and secretly assured himself of the assent of a majority of the canons, who bound themselves with oaths to adopt it. A meeting of the chapter was called, and the measure was sprung upon it, in violation of its rules of order. As he frankly said, if notice had been given, and discussion allowed, it could not have been passed, for the conversos would have intrigued successfully against it. The vote in its favor was twenty-five to ten, not including the dean, who opposed it but had no vote. The minority claimed that they were the wiser and better part of the chapter, and probably they were, for they included the archdeacons of Guadalajara and Talavera, both sons of the Duke del Infantado, and Juan de Vergara, one of the most illustrious men of letters of the day, who had had experience of the rigor of the Inquisition. This action aroused so much excitement in the city that the royal council sent an alcalde de corte, who reported that, for the sake of peace, the statute had better not be enforced, in consequence of which Prince Philip, then holding the cortes of Monson, sent orders to suspend it until the emperor's pleasure could be learned. The struggle was thus transferred to the imperial court and to Rome. The matter was argued publicly in the Rota, when the conclusion was against confirmation, and the Pope signed a brief to that effect, but the archbishop's envoy, Diego de Guzman, used such persuasive arguments that Paul secretly evoked the matter to himself, and signed another brief, May 28, 1548, confirming the statute, so that each side could boast of his support. Charles referred the question back to the royal council, to which both sides presented memorials. Their temper may be judged by the argument of the chapter that, after so many religious bodies had adopted the exclusion, if the opponents contend it to be unscriptural, they are manifest heretics and should be burnt to ashes. A memorial of Siliceo to Charles is in the same key. A strange medley of evils is attributed to Jews and conversos. Even the German Lutherans are descendants of Jews. On taking possession of his archbishopric, he had found that nearly all the beneficed priests and those having cure of souls were of Jewish extraction, and there was danger of conversos obtaining entire possession of the church, owing to the sale of preferment in Rome, where there were at the time five or six thousand Spaniards, most of them conversos, bargaining for benefices. It was the same in the other professions, where judges, lawyers, notaries, scriveners, farmers of the revenue, etc., were mostly of Jewish stock, and they alone were physicians, surgeons, and apothecaries, in spite of all that the Inquisition had burnt and was daily burning. They adopted these callings solely for the purpose of killing Christians. It was but the other day that, in a Toledo auto, there was reconciled a surgeon who always placed a poisonous powder in the wounds of his Christian patients. If Charles did not confirm the statute, the outlook was that the conversos would govern the church of Toledo. While as all this may seem to us, 
it gives us a valuable insight into the impulses which governed Spain in its dealings with the alien races within her borders. It was a humiliating admission that they were regarded as men of superior intelligence and ability, whose wrongs for generations had converted them into irreconcilable enemies, the object of mingled dread and detestation. As they could not be matched in intellect, the only policy was brute repression and extermination. Of course, Siliceo carried the day. The confirmation of his statute by Paul III was conclusive and was regarded as establishing on irrefragable grounds the necessity of limpieza as a qualification for all who aspired to a position in church or state. Toledo maintained it even against the Pope. In 1573, the Venetian envoy, Leonardo Donato, reports that he had seen all the authority of the stern Pius V vainly exerted to secure the archidiaconate of Toledo for a servant of his who was not limpio, and who finally had to content himself with transferring the dignity to another, and retaining a heavy pension on the revenues. It was not only in Toledo that the capacity of the conversos was filling the minds of the faithful with dire apprehensions of their ultimate triumph over their oppressors. While Siliceo was at work, the Inquisition was endeavouring to enforce the brief by which, in 1525, Clement VII had excluded them from the Observantine Franciscans. To the Suprema its fiscal represented that the unbridled license of frailes of Jewish descent had prevailed to such an extent that they were elected as general and provincial ministers, guardians, vicars, procurators, visitors, and other officials, to the opposition of the old Christians of the order, who were thus excluded from office, causing daily scandals and threatening worse. Valdez consequently ordered the brief to be published anew, and observed everywhere under heavy penalties. Thereupon the general of the order, Andreas de Insula, was incensed, and, on the assumption that this had been instigated by old Christian frailes, threatened to punish them severely. The Suprema therefore appealed to Julius III, reciting all this, and pointing out the crafty and unscrupulous ways in which that unquiet race disturbed the peace of all bodies to which it found entrance, forming factions, and aspiring to rule, with the object of ruining the old Christians, thus opening the way to a return of Judaism and the destruction of Christianity. Julius responded favorably, in a brief of September 21, 1550, instructing Valdez to summon the general Andreas and all concerned to obey the decree of Clement, and granting him full powers to decide summarily the prosecutions proposed with a view to protect the old Christians from molestation, using for the purpose whatever censures might be necessary. It shows how indomitable were the conversos that confirmatory briefs had to be procured from Gregory the Thirteenth and Sixtus the Fifth. Yet again the Holy See manifested its inconsistency, for when the chapter of Seville, in 1565, petitioned Pius the Fourth to confirm a statute of limpieza, he refused and condemned the Spanish practice as contrary to law and as upsetting the churches. Cardinal Pacheco defended it and described the evils wrought by the Jews when Pius turned fiercely on him, saying that he would do as he thought best and that the Spaniards all tried to be popes. When those who had a slightest taint of Jewish or Moorish blood were thus regarded as not only implacable enemies of the Christian faith, but as gifted with preeminent intelligence and craft, it became impossible for the Inquisition to consider them as fitted for its service. One would have expected it to take the initiative, and the only subject of surprise is that it should have been so late in adopting for itself the rule which it was enforcing on other bodies. Discrimination may have been exercised in special cases, but, till the middle of the sixteenth century, there is no trace of any systematic adoption of limpieza as a test. A carta acordada of July 20, 1543, and a decree of Prince Philip in 1545, respecting the numbers and character of familiars, are silent as to this as a qualification. 
the first allusion to it that I have met occurs in a commission issued to Francisco Romeo as scrivener of confiscations in Saragossa, signed April 16, 1546, by the Inquisitor General, but not countersigned by members of the Suprema until July 9th, quote, after the inquisitors of Aragon had ascertained the limpieza of the said Francisco Romeo. End quote. A step forward is seen in the instructions issued by the Suprema, October 10th of this same year, in which it ordered that no familiar be received until it is ascertained that he is an old Christian. Still, this was rejected as a general principle, for, when the Cortes of Monzon, in 1547, complained that Moriscos were appointed as familiars, the answer of the Suprema was a formal declaration that the Inquisition regarded as capable of holding office all who had been baptized and who lived as Christians, except heretics or apostates or fautors of heretics. This vacillation continued. A number of appointments subsequent to that of Romeo have no allusion to Limpieza until 1549, when, on April 9th, Valdés inquires of the inquisitors of Barcelona whether Jerónimo de Tombos, candidate for the receivership, possesses the qualifications of limpieza and habits required in officials, and whether there is anything connected with his wife to prevent his appointment. So, on April 8th, when Moya de Contreras, inquisitor of Saragossa, proposed to employ commissioners of the Cruzada, Valdés emphatically negatived the suggestion, giving, among other reasons, the fact that the officials of the Cruzada were not tan limpios de sangre. Yet, in an order of October 8th of the same year, to the Tribunal of Cuenca, remodeling its familiars, there is no allusion to the necessity of limpieza. This uncertainty continued yet for a while, of which further instances could be cited, but a decisive step seemed to be taken when Philip, in instructions of March 10, 1553, concerning the Concordia of Castile, prescribed that all familiars must be old Christians, and yet a carta acordada of March 20th on the same subject makes no allusion to such a condition. The tribunals appear to have been somewhat slack in conforming their patronage to the new regulation. December 23, 1560, the Suprema felt it necessary to order that all familiars must be married men and limpios. When the inquisitor-general made an appointment and required the inquisitors to certify to the limpieza of the nominee, they would do so, as appears from the commission of Bernaldo Mancipi, as assistant notary of sequestrations in Barcelona in 1561, but in the same year Inspector Cervantes reported that they paid no attention to it in their appointments of commissioners, consultores, and familiars, a negligence which continued, for, in 1568, the Suprema was obliged to rebuke them for it. This is scarce surprising when Philip II himself, in 1565, had issued a series of conciliatory instructions regarding the Moriscos of Valencia, in which he ordered that their leading men should be made familiars. End of Book 4, Chapter 4, Part 1